Hello and welcome to Bun Med, where we discuss concise medical knowledge that you can fit inside of a bun. So in this video, we're going to be having a look at what haemophilia is, how it may present, and we, what we may do to treat it. So firstly, what does haemophilia refer to? Well, hemo refers to blood, and ophelia is a likenessness towards or a tendency to. Therefore, we can expect patients with haemophilia to be at a higher risk of uh, bleeding, not only recurrent, but also severe. But what actually is the disease itself? Well, haemophilia is either a deficiency of factor 8 in haemophilia A or deficiency of factor 9 in haemophilia B. And the thing to note is that uh, factor 8 deficiency or A is significantly more common than haemophilia B. Now, the chromosomes which code for uh, the factor 8 and factor 9 genes are actually the X chromosome. So therefore, these conditions are X-linked recessive conditions. And one thing to note is that even though uh, most cases of haemophilia A and B are inherited, up to 30% of haemophilia cases uh, may be a sporadic mutation and therefore have no link to the parent whatsoever. Now, a various um, number of mutations may actually go on to cause haemophilia A and B, but the one we're going to just be focusing on a little bit is this thing known as the flip tip inversion that's often seen in severe haemophilia A. So how does this come about? Well, let's have a, a review of it. So here you can see we have an X chromosome and the Y chromosome. And what you'll notice is that the X chromosome is significantly longer in length than the Y chromosome. This sets up an interesting situation where the X chromosome is able to bend around itself, putting these two very special regions next to each other and allowing genes from this region to cross over. This essentially means that the factor VIII gene can be disrupted, and essentially means that our factor VIII is not formed. In the case of haemophilia B, this may be that uh, to the factor IX gene, we have something like a missense or a nonsense mutation. Whatever the case is, we end up not producing enough factor VIII or factor IX. So how does this affect our clotting cascade? Well, here you can see we have the clotting cascade, and what you'll notice is that both factor VIII and factor IX play a major role in the intrinsic pathway to help us form thrombin and fibrin. Not having enough of these essentially means we turn off the intrinsic pathway or we really reduce its effect. And therefore, we are simply not able to form enough fibrin, and therefore we cannot stabilize our uh, platelet plug using fibrin. So... Which kind of groups of people do we tend to see haemophilia A and B in? Well, we often tend to see this in males as they are X-linked recessive conditions. However, there may be exceptions to the rule where we may see haemophilia in females. And a condition like this may be something like Turner's syndrome. We don't have to focus a great deal of detail on them. It's just good to know a, um, an alteration to the rule that might occur. So what sort of symptoms might we expect to see in patients with haemophilia A and B? Well, the first thing that we may notice as a neonate is prolonged bleeding in the heel prick test. So in the UK, uh, around five to nine days in, babies are often uh, pricked in their heel um, just to check for a whole host of genetic conditions. And one thing that haemophilia may do is increase the time that the baby bleeds for from its heel. As the child is growing up, we may see things like bleeding into joints or even when it falls over, things like bleeding uh, into the muscle and bleeding into the joints as well. And the massive issue with bleeding into the joints, especially those with poorly controlled haemophilia, is that they may get uh, severe joint deformities as they grow up, especially if this happens time and time again, leading to um, really, really uh, functional reducing arthritis. Uh, and this can have a massive impact on their quality of life. And lastly, we may see things like extensive and large bruising all over the body, because remember, we're not able to stabilize our platelet plug. So what kind of investigations do we want to carry out in, hemo, uh, in patients who we think may have haemophilia? Well, the first thing we want to do is a full blood count, just to make sure that our platelets are working okay and our uh, primary hemostasis is okay. And because this is a condition uh, where we're only affecting the clotting factors, our full blood count should be entirely normal. The next thing we want to do is carry out some clotting studies. And again, remember, we are turning off or significantly reducing the action of the intrinsic pathway. So there were, therefore, we're going to get a prolonged APTT. The next thing we want to do is make sure that our, uh, we have enough factor VIII and factor IX. So we can do some factor VIII and factor IX assays. And based on whether we have haemophilia A or haemophilia B, we're going to have reduced levels of either factor VIII or factor IX. But remember, because haemophilia A is significantly more common, I've put on the slides that you might see reduced factor VIII in haemophilia A. 
Another thing that might give you a prolonged APTT is von Willebrand's disease. So it's really important to do a von Willebrand factor assay and make sure that the levels of von Willebrand factor is normal. And lastly, we should carry out some liver function tests because remember these proteins are actually made in the liver itself. So therefore, if our liver is dysfunctioning, we may also get a reduced levels of factor eight and factor nine. So what can we do to treat patients with hemophilia A? Well, we can actually break these down into principles of management. And if, say, for instance, we're trying to stop bleeding or uh, prevent bleeding from occurring uh, in patients with hemophilia, the things that we can do is give them regular recombinant factor eight or factor nine, essentially replenishing their levels of factor eight and factor nine and reducing their likelihood of bleeding. If they have a spontaneous bleed or this is their first presentation, what we may do is give some on-demand treatment. If the bleeding is somewhat mild, we may give things like tranexamic acid, which is an antifibrinolytic, which essentially means we stop the breakdown of the fibrin sheath. And we may give desmopressin, this drug, which helps to release uh, some factor rate from our endothelial cells. If the condition is severe and we have some severe bleeding, we may give a bolus of recombinant factor rate or factor nine based on which hemophilia they have. Of course, it's very, very important to take the whole patient into consideration and take a holistic approach. And this may mean uh, involvement of a MDT is to suit the patient's needs. One interesting thing to understand is that uh, recurrent exposure to recombinant factor eight and factor nine might mean that the patient develops autoantibodies against factor eight and factor nine, um, meaning that they become less uh, useful at preventing bleeding. And the patient therefore may develop a tolerance to it. In these cases, we can use some kind of bypassing agent to bypass the action of factor eight and factor nine. And an example of this might be something like Novo7 or activated factor seven concentrate, which will use the extrinsic pathway, uh, just boost the action of the extrinsic pathway rather than use the intrinsic pathway. And lastly, and one of the most important points to make is it's very important to take the whole patient into account and take a holistic approach. And this requires the action of a multidisciplinary team. That concludes the video. Hope you guys found it useful. Please feel free to share and subscribe. And if you have any comments, leave them below and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. See you in the next one.